washed in the blood of Jesus and born again. Hallelujah, and saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me the way. For a long time I've traveled down a long, lonely road. My heart was so heavy, in sin I sank low. Then I heard about Jesus, what a wonderful hour. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out through his saving power. Thank God I Prison, I've taken my blood like the blind man that God gave back his sight. And like a poor, wretched beggar, I found fortune and fame. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out through his holy name. Thank God. Take your Bible this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1, if you would please, Ezekiel chapter 1. Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 4 through 10. Verses 4 through 10, and we read these verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 4, then I read verse 5. Together again on 6, and we alternate like that till we end together on verse 10 of Ezekiel chapter 1. And as our custom is here, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. We'll begin together on verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 1. Ready? And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward." As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, 
They four also had the face of an eagle. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God and thank you for preserving your word for us that we hold copies of it in our hand this morning. And Lord, I'm praying that you would help each of us to pray together and to ask you to speak to our hearts through your word this morning. We believe the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, we want to give our attention to Your Word. And may the Spirit of God bring the Word of God home to our heart. Lord, I pray that You'd bless the special now and that it would prepare our heart to receive the Word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Like a babe when it cries for its mother Like a child I was helpless alone Then I met the master Now I am one of his own For all things were changed when he found me, a new day broke through all around me, for I met the master. Now I belong to him, like a blind man who walks in the darkness. I had longed, I had searched for the light. Then I met the master. Now I walk no more in the night. For all things were changed when he found me. All around me, for I met the master. Now I belong to him, for I met the master. Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. Again, Father, thank you so much for our salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you will now help us and speak to each and every heart this morning. Help us, Lord, in the next few moments to give you our undivided attention. And Lord, I pray that you'll minister to each and every heart that's here this morning as only you can. Help me to be clear in what we present today and Help us to understand the vision that you gave to Ezekiel and how it would help him to be an effective servant and how it will help us to be effective Christians for you. So speak to our hearts today. Move up and down the aisle and in and out of the rows. Stop at every occupied seat and speak to each individual. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to talk to you this morning on the subject of being a four-faced Christian. Um, Ezekiel is being called here to serve God. The Israelites are already in captivity. Ezekiel is in Babylon. And God is, he's been allowed to go with the people of God there. And he's allowed to carry out his priestly duties there in Babylon. God is commissioning him in chapter 1. 
he's calling him and letting him know what it is that he wants him to do. You find out earlier in the chapter he makes the mention the hand of the Lord was upon me there. And he's by the river Kibar and, and, and God is dealing with him. And uh, you ever felt the hand of God on you? You ever felt God dealing with you about something? This was Ezekiel's time. And God was dealing with him. And what he sees is a vision. And in the vision, he sees four creatures. Four living creatures. And each of those four living creatures, each have four faces. I know some have been accused of having two faces. But these had four faces. And I, I, it reminded me of the two little boys that were going out to pick their, they were going to pick out their trick-or-treating masks to wear. And the one boy said to his friend when they went into the store, now don't fall for the first ugly face you see. I thought that might be good marriage advice too. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, the fellow, the most fellows would hope that wouldn't be true. But um, these creatures had four faces. And I think each one of these faces, as God showed them to Ezekiel, I think there's some importance to them. I think there's a reason that God tells us what they are. And I believe there's application that we draw from that as we look at these four faces. I think they... I think God's telling Ezekiel, these are the qualities I want to see in you as you serve me. And I think God would tell us, these are the qualities that He wants to see in us as believers. Not to, not to just be a Christian, but to be a good Christian. Not just to be a Christian, but to be an out-and-out -out Christian. If you're going to be in this thing, why not be in it all the way? That's a good spot for an amen right there. If you're going to serve God, do it with all your heart. Amen? And, and so a Christian that, that wants to please God in all they do. A Christian that desires to bring glory to God in all they say and do. And this is the attributes or the qualities that I think the Lord would have us to have. I want to take these faces, not necessarily in the order that they're listed here, but I want to look at all four of those faces this morning. The first face you see here uh, that I want to point out to you where the Bible says they had the face of a lion. They had the face of a lion. Now we know uh, that Jesus was called the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion is always strength. In fact, he's called the king of the jungle. All right? And the lion is strong. Adrian Rogers tells a story about a man who bragged that he had cut off the tail of a man-eating lion with his pocket knife. Someone said, why didn't you cut off his head? He said, well, someone already done that. <laughs> so maybe not so strong as you think he is. Be strong in the Lord. How many times do you see that phrase repeated over and over in the Bible? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I think about how he told Joshua in the book of Joshua, to be strong and of good courage. Joshua is taken over from Moses, and Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. Now they're almost back to the point, and they are back to the point, to the Jordan River where they were 40 years earlier. But 40 years earlier, they weren't strong in the Lord. You remember 40 years earlier when they came up to Kadesh Barnea, which is the last stop before you crossed Jordan, they, they sent in the spies to spy out the land. And the spies came back and they, ten of the twelve spies gave what the Bible calls an evil report. And what they said was, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. They brought back some huge grapes that they had to put on a, on a pole and carry between two men. They were so huge. But they said there's giants there. They're big people there. In fact, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. They look like giants to us and we look like grasshoppers to them. We're not going in there. You understand? They weren't being strong in the Lord. They were thinking they'd be strong in themselves. 
And they decided, the, the people all believed the ten, not the two, Joshua and Caleb, that said, we can possess this land. God says it, then God can do it. Two men said, let's be strong in the Lord. The ten said, let's rely on ourselves, and they turned back. Forty years later, they're back to the same spot. No wonder God would have to encourage Joshua to be strong in the Lord. Don't worry about how many men you have. Don't worry about how big the army is. Don't worry about the, the, the size of the people you're going to attack. Don't worry about the enemy. I am able to drive them out. Be strong in the Lord. Strength. Well, they possessed the land, didn't they? They went in and conquered. The first city they came to was a city called Jericho. And, and God teaches them to rely upon Him because remember the method of conquering Jericho? I mean, it was tanks and bazookas and well-placed grenade launchers. No, it wasn't any of that, was it? One little kid came home and talked about how they blew this up and they blew this up and they attacked with these tanks and, and, and all in conquering the city of Jericho. And his mom looked at him and said, Are you sure that's what your Sunday school teacher taught you? He said, No, nah, but what he told me you'd never believe. <laughs> so, and, and that's about how it was. You know what they did to attack it? They marched around it. One time a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day. And they were not allowed to say a word. Silence. By the way, that, was, that probably was a miracle in itself. <laughs> Get that many people to walk around a place and not say anything. Plus, because I'm sure there are people, remember Jericho had the big walls? I'm sure there are people on the wall yelling stuff down at them, don't you think? What are you doing? What's the matter with you guys? Taunting them, I'm sure. But they couldn't say a word. They would have marched around in silence. And then when they went around the seventh time on the seventh day, they gave a great shout. The priests blew the trumpets. And you know what the Bible says? The walls fell down flat. How about that? And they went straight in and conquered the city. Who'd have, who'd have thought of that? God was teaching them something, though. You don't win the battles. I do. You have to be strong, not in yourself, but you be strong in the Lord. So when the Bible says you have the face of a lion, it means you're strong and you have strength, but it's not your strength. Because your strength will fail you. What happened after Jericho? They had the next city they came to. It wasn't a big city like Jericho. It was a little city. In fact, it had a little name. Two letters, A-I. They said, oh, that's just a little thing. We won't even send everybody up to do that. We'll just send a few guys up to take care of this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're missing something here. Did they ask God? Did they say, God, what's, you told me the plan for Jericho. What's the plan for Ai? No, they didn't pray. Who were they relying on? We can take this one. It's just a little thing. Hmm? Oh, they went up to Ai and they got whipped. In fact, 36 men died of Israel. And they came back to camp defeated. 36, 36 wives didn't have a husband come home to them. 36 families, children didn't have a daddy come home to them that night. You know why? Because Israel relied on their strength, not God's strength. You know the situation, they disobeyed God and they were just relying on themselves. And listen, you know when you get defeated? When you think you got this. Oh, I, I got this. I don't have to pray. I don't have to ask God to help me with this. Hmm? The Bible says that we're, we're to take everything to God in prayer. We're going to be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known unto God. Why? Without Him, I can do nothing. Oh, it looks like something. And we think we're accomplishing something, but we're not. Not in God's eyes. And it will surely bring us to defeat. You have to rely on the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His night. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage. 
When Solomon built the temple, be strong therefore and do it, he told Solomon. Be strong in the Lord, Timothy. In other words, he's saying, don't just settle being a Christian in your own strength. Be a Christian in God's strength. Be a Christian relying on God to strengthen you. Be clean and be separate and be holy and be faithful. Listen, it takes a strong Christian to stand up for God in the day in which we live. It takes strong Christians relying on God's strength and looking to God for their help, looking for God for their courage to take a stand for Him in the day in which we live. Stand up for right and stand up for decency. A strong Christian will witness to those he works with. A strong Christian carries a Bible with him and not ashamed to do so. A strong Christian will dress and look differently than the world because they're here to please God. You see, a strong Christian is pure and decent in a world that, that would be corrupt and immoral and keeps themselves pure for God to use so they can be a vessel unto honor unto God. A strong Christian is able to say no to temptation. A strong Christian says no to alcohol. It's a strong Christian that says no to tobacco. See, it's not your strength, it's God's strength. It's not your courage, it's God's courage. And you look to Him to strengthen you. You stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high His royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Stand and be strong for Christ. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a face of a lion when it comes to being a Christian? Do you rely on God's strength and do you have that strength to stand alone if necessary? Dare to stand alone for Christ. Claim the blood He sacrificed. Lift the name of Jesus high. Press onward to the sky. The face of a lion. Ezekiel, you're, gonna, you're in captivity, you're in Babylon, and if you're going to deal with these people and deal with the Babylonians, you better have the strength of a lion. You better rely on my strength. You better have the face of a lion. You're going to have to be strong. There's another face he saw. The face of a lion on the right side. Then he said that a face of an ox on the left side. An ox, I hope you don't think you have one of those already, but an ox was a beast of burden. We still use expressions like that. Oh, he works like an ox. Or he's strong as an ox. Those expressions came from the Bible. Understanding an ox was a beast of burden and an ox was a worker. Can I help you understand? You say, Ezekiel, you know what you're not going to do? If you're, you know what you're going to do if you're here? You're going to have to work. There's, the, 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 listen, lazy and Christian shouldn't go in the same sentence. No, nowhere in the Bible does God excuse laziness in a Christian. In fact, He says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Because you don't serve, hey, I don't, it doesn't matter to me where you work. It doesn't matter who you name your employer. When you go to work tomorrow morning, you don't work for the company. You work for Jesus Christ. And you labor for Him and you always give it your best. Someone said very often we're halfway out of our predicament when we get up and start working. You understand, everybody, everybody can't get up and sing like you heard these singers this morning. Not everybody can get up and play an instrument like you heard these folks playing instruments this morning. Not everybody's going to get up and teach a class like those who taught Sunday school this morning. Not everyone can get up and preach a message. And maybe you're saying we already see that. But not everybody can do that. But you know what everybody can do? Everybody can work. Everybody can work. Everybody can work hard. Everybody can labor for the Master. The songwriter said, let us labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. When all of life is over and our work on earth is done, 
When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. You know, it's something great about working for the Lord. It's interesting, too, when you, when you work with an oxen, usually in the Bible, it's always a yoke of oxen, which means there's more than one. There's two. So he's here to tell Ezekiel, you're not only going to work, but you're going to have to learn how to work with other people. Sometimes people say, well, I work, I just work alone. I don't want anybody around me when I work. Well, see, as a Christian, you have to learn to work with others. You're part of a, a, a church family. You're part of the family of God. And you have to learn how to work with other people and get along with other people. The emphasis is not just on how you'll work, but how well you'll work with others. And in getting the cause of Christ around the world. You see, it's amazing. Someone says it's amazing how much could be accomplished if no one worried about who got credit. Oftentimes, the people who say, I just work by myself, is because they want all the credit going to them. When someone says, who did this? They just want their name mentioned and nobody else's. But the Bible makes it clear that the greatest among you is to be your servant. You ever notice the, the Gospels all give a different perspective on Jesus Christ? In Matthew, He's the King of the Jews. And it starts out with His birth and then Herod wanting to kill Him because the wise man came to worship a king. You go to the Gospel of Luke and He's the Son of Man and, and His genealogy in Luke goes back to Adam. John presents Him as the Son of God. And John starts out, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. It goes back to the beginning with God. But Mark portrays Jesus Christ as a servant. There's no genealogy in Mark. Because it doesn't matter what the ancestry of a servant is. No, no name given in Mark, just, just a servant. You see, are you a servant? Are you willing to serve others? Are you willing to serve with others? How do you feel when somebody uh, you, you help and work with someone else and they talk about things that got done and your name didn't get mentioned? Well, I was there too. And I mean, didn't recognize my name. How can you leave me out? And I put in more time than anybody else. So were you doing it for the glory of God or were you doing it so you'd get credit? Boy, it's quiet in here. Huh? You want me to go on to another face real quick? It's the face of an ox and working. So an ox is for work, but you know an oxen was also for sacrifice. If you're going to be a servant of God, if you're going to serve God acceptably, there has to be sacrifice. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is saying, I think, listen, every believer ought to present ourselves to God, not, not are you willing to die for God, but are you willing to live for Him? A living sacrifice. So the first thing I see about a sacrifice is you've got to be willing. When Abraham sacrificed Isaac on that altar, Isaac was very well capable and strong enough to say, I'm not getting on that altar. I'm not going to do it. But he willingly laid himself on that altar to be the sacrifice if that's what God wanted. Are you willing? What is it you're unwilling to give to God? What is it you're unwilling to be a sacrifice to God? Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll go to church, Pastor, but, you know, Sunday morning. I'm not doing this Sunday night stuff. What are you unwilling to put on the altar? What are you unwilling to do for God? You see, a willing sacrifice. The second thing about a sacrifice, you only has to be willing, but the second thing about a sacrifice, obviously, is something's got to die. 
Now, God isn't telling us to die physically, but He is telling us to die to what I want, what I think, what I feel, and yield myself to what He wants and what He thinks and what He feels. Will I die to self? That's what Paul meant when he said, I die daily. Paul, you, you planted churches. Paul, you wrote half the New Testament. Paul, you were greatly used of God as a soul winner. Man, how could Paul do all that? You know how he did it? He died to Paul. He did what God wanted. Do you die to self? When's the last time you really wanted to do something and you said, no, I'm not going to do it? I'm just not going to do it because I want to tell myself that myself's not in control, God is. That's, that's tough for Americans. Because we're used to doing just about anything we want to do. But God says, are we willing to die to ourselves? Am I willing to be a living sacrifice to God? Let me ask you a question. Does God have all of you? No, I didn't ask if you were a Christian. I hope you are. I hope you know Christ as your Savior. But have you ever laid yourself on the altar? Said, God, I'm yours. Do with me whatever you want. Well, Pastor, wait a minute. I got plans for my life. What about God's plans for your life? What does God want you to do? You see, when you, when you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart and life, and you know what He says? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. He paid, He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for you, He shed His blood on the cross for you. So your sins could be forgiven. And what is it to say, yeah, I, hey, I want the salvation you gave me. I appreciate Jesus dying for me, and I want that salvation. I don't want to die and go to hell for my sin. But Lord, and then I take His gift, and I take His salvation, and I say, now leave me alone and let me live my life. How can you do that? Brother Lindeman here. I said, Brother Lindeman, he, he comes and says, you know what, I really love you, Pastor. I appreciate you. And, and listen, here's $100,000. Your wife's not here. She'll never know. <laughs> now, how would you, what, what would you think of me if I accept that $100,000 gift? And then, he calls me up and I don't answer. He comes to talk to me and I say, I don't have time for you. And you observe this and, and, and you say, well, what about you and Chuck? I said, that guy? I mean, he's okay. He's a nice guy, but I just don't have time for him. What would you say to me? You say, you're pretty ungrateful, aren't you? After what he's done for you? After what he's given you? And you want nothing to do with him? And that's for a measly $100,000. God gave his only begotten son for you and me. And people receive his gift and say, yeah, I want the eternal life that Jesus paid for. And then you know what they do with their life? God, leave me alone. I want to do what I want to do. Pretty ungrateful, aren't we? Are you a living sacrifice? Do you work for God? I don't, we don't work for God to be accepted by Him. We don't work for God to earn anything with Him. We work for God because we love and appreciate what He's done for us. And we, our work is motivated by our love for Him. Face of a lion, face of an ox. Then he says they had the face of an eagle. The face of an eagle. While the lion shows us strength and the ox shows us work and sacrifice, the face of an eagle shows us vision. Vision. 
It's interesting to note, after watching the bald eagle in flight, Benjamin Franklin wanted to make the wild turkey the American national bird. Imagine we'd all been a bunch of turkeys. Somehow I think he may have been closer than the eagle, but... The eagle has a seven-foot wingspan and its 7,000 lightweight feathers allow it to rise thousands of feet into the air with seemingly no effort. Maybe it was Isaiah who saw those eagles soaring and flying. And God said, write this down, Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Thou mount up with wings as eagles. They'll soar through the sky. Going higher and, and, and going to places where they'd never be able to get to on their own. Because God lifts them up. But you know what I didn't know is of the creatures that God made, the eagle can see further than any other. Eagles can soar so high because they can see so much. Someone said, poor eyesight will limit your sight, but poor vision limits your deeds. Vision says you go forward. In fact, did you notice in, this, in the passage in verse 9 when he saw this, the, in the, this image in their wings, they're joined one to another, it says they turn not when... When they went, they went every one straight forward. Vision says I, 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 we, we keep pressing on. We keep pressing forward. Godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. This is, this is uh, illustrated for us real fresh in our minds from yesterday. Praying, praying faithfully, diligently, praying and watching. I've been praying for days for about that weather yesterday. And then looking at my phone and looking at that weather report. Watching it be pretty minimal at 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. And then it gets to be noon to 4 p.m. and looking at being 70% chance of rain, 80% chance of rain. By 4 o'clock, 90% chance of rain. And saying, God, you got to move that. God, you got to move that. Or Tanya, I told your dad, we met him on Friday. I said, Brother Jarvis, I've called your name in prayer often this week. I said, God, if you did that for Brother Jarvis in Mexico, you can do that for here in Grove City. Those storms aren't any different down there than they are here. Just break that thing up and move it around. And, and we've uh, been praying about that. 4.30 in the morning, my wife woke me up, Saturday morning, and she said, she's looking at her phone, reading off the percentages of the rain from noon to 4. I said, you woke me up at 4.30 a.m. to tell me that? <laughs> then at 6.30, she called me and said, wow, it's down to, I think, 30% or something like that by then. By the time we started, it was like 15%. And most of you know, we had a shower go through early, and then it was beautiful the rest of the time. A few spread or sprinkle here or there felt kind of good. And God, God blessed us. You know what that is? That's faith, not fear. Faith, not fear. A godly vision will glorify God. A godly vision will require risk-taking. For too long, we, we fall in. I heard somebody today, it was, a, it was a broadcast on the radio, and I can't tell you when it was or where. I was in my car, I know that. It might have been in the morning. I think it was early in the morning. And, um, and, and was, they were interviewing a missionary, I believe, but he had started a ministry or something, but something really jumped out to me that he said. He said, we're, what, do you, a lot of, what, what do we always kind of fall into saying when we leave somebody? We say, right, we'll see you later now. Be safe. Be safe. He says, we don't say that to each other anymore. When we get ready to part from another believer in, in our ministry, he said, you know what we say? We're ready to part. We look at each other and say, okay, 
Uh, we'll see you later. Take risks. Take risks. Why would you tell somebody to take risks? Because that gets God involved. That gets God involved in your life. I'm not interested in playing it safe. I want God to be involved. Let's step out by faith. Take some steps of faith where you say, God, if you don't do this, I don't know what's going to happen. Those priests, when they crossed Jordan, the Jordan at the place they crossed is about six foot deep or so. And you know what? They had to step. The water didn't part till their feast priest hit the water. Their feet hit the water and then God parted it. I don't know about you, but if I'm the first priest in line, that's a little shaky. I mean, I don't mind if it's all parted, then I step in, but where's faith in that? The Bible doesn't say see it, then believe it. The Bible says believe it, and thou shalt see it. How's your vision this morning? How's your vision? What do you see God doing with you in your life? You know, the Bible makes it clear. These people in the Bible, they weren't perfect people. That's why God in the Bible would often show us their warts and their misgivings, their shortcomings, all of that. Because if He only put the perfect ones in there, we'd have said, well, that's great to use those people, but man, I'm not in that category. But when a guy loses his temper and he still used them, hmm? the guys had shortcomings and, and, and moral failures and God still used them, then you and I look at that and say, well, I guess if God will use a Samson and a Moses, and I guess he can use me. And he does. What do you see God doing with your life? What's your vision? An eagle has vision. What do you see God doing with your life? I'll move on and get this wrapped up, but an eagle also retains its youth longer than any other creature. That's why it says you'll mount up with wings as eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. Keep up your energy to go forward for God. The lion, face of a lion for strength, the face of an ox for work and for sacrifice, the face of the eagle for vision and energy, and then the last face that we'll look at, which was the first face mentioned, was the face of a man. The face of a man. I want you to turn from Ezekiel to the 8th Psalm. Would you look there, please? Psalm 8, and we'll wrap it up this morning. Psalm 8. Thanks for listening today. I appreciate your attention. Psalm 8. You see, no matter how strong the lion is, no matter how hard the ox works, no matter how high the eagle soars, they cannot and they were not made to fellowship with God. Only man is made. That was reserved for mankind. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth, who has set Thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast Thou ordained strength because of Thine enemies, that Thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast made, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion, that's rule, over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Do you see the elevation of man above all of God's creation? The elevated place man has. You're, when Jesus said uh, that, that not a sparrow falls to the ground, but God notices the sparrow, but what did He say next? You are of more value than many sparrows. 
Man is of more value than any animal. God created man in His image. Only man can look up to God. Only man can say, as the publican did in our Sunday school lesson, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Only God, only, only man can read the book God has given to us. Only man can receive God's salvation. Only man can pray to God and communicate with Him. Only man can receive the Spirit of God. Only man can live a life holy unto God. God created all things for man to enjoy. In fact, Revelation 4 says we were created for His pleasure. For God's pleasure. To bring pleasure to Him. We were made to fellowship with God. God in the garden had a fellowship with Adam and Eve. He would come down, the Bible says, to walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden. How great was that? Until God came down that day and they were hiding from Him. What made them hide from God? They sinned against Him. You know what makes people hide from God today? Same thing. Hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. Sin broke that fellowship with God. God put Adam and Eve out of the garden. Put a flaming angel there to keep him with a flaming sword to keep him from going back in the garden. Fellowship from God was broken off. Sin had come between them. That's when God, listen, that's why God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. So He could pay for your sin. So that which is between you and God can be taken away. And fellowship with God can be restored again. God didn't, God didn't send His Son, Jesus Christ, just to keep you from going to hell. That's a wonderful side benefit. But the purpose of Jesus coming was for you to have fellowship with God again. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which God saved you? He saved you so you could pray to God. He saved you so you could talk to God. He saved you so God could talk to you through His Word. He saved you so you could glorify Him and honor Him and bless Him with your life. That's why He saved you. Only man can do that. No other creature. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which God saved you? Are you bringing pleasure to God? How wonderful it is to be a human being created in the image of God. Face. Face of a lion for strength. Face of an ox for work and sacrifice. The face of the eagle for vision and energy. The face of a man to fellowship with God. To have a relationship with Him. I ask you a simple question this morning. Are you four-faced? Why don't you ask God to make you a four-faced Christian? Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning? Thank you, Lord, for this vision that you gave to Ezekiel to prepare him for the ministry that you would have him to do. And Lord, these qualities, these characteristics of this, these creatures that Ezekiel saw, I believe you would have us to say, if that's what you wanted for Ezekiel, that's what you would want for us. And this morning I'm asking you, God, that you would give each of us that face of a lion. That we would gather our strength from you. That we would be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That you would give us <clears throat> that face of an ox for working, for laboring for you in your strength and being willing to be a sacrifice to die to self and be alive unto God. 
Help us to have the face of the eagle. Give us a vision of what you could do in us and through us with our lives. Remind us the face of a man because we were made for God. And Lord, this morning, if there's an emptiness in the heart of somebody in this room today or several somebodies, may they know that emptiness they feel is an emptiness that can only be filled by Jesus Christ because they are a human being. And that hole in their heart will not be filled by anything or satisfied by anything except the relationship with God through your Son, Jesus Christ. Minister to people's hearts, Lord. Speak to their heart. I pray you have. 